This is the Earth Science Classroom, the channel dedicated to everything geoscience, earth science, physical geography, geology, atmospheric science, astronomy, everything that you can do in the geoscience classroom is discussed here. So today, this video is on the general systems theory. And it's part of both the geomorphology unit and playlist and also the Earth as a system playlist. And this video is going to look at some different things. So we're going to first look at the historical perspective and the different uh, scientists that have molded and developed this systems theory. We're going to look at what it covers. We're going to look at the um, related fields and how we're going to discuss it in terms of an introductory piece for geomorphology. All right, join me now. All right, so the title is kind of like a flowchart. I've done here with, uh, you know, geomorphology as a title, right there. I have looked at, well, kind of linking up the Earth as a system. And we discussed various systems and various type systems. We discussed, obviously, uh, types in a different video, so please check it out. We discussed uh, equilibrium and steady state in a different video again. Please check that out. And it all comes under even lag time, which is a different video as well. Because all these different topics have their own discussion, their own different um, uh, relationships, different uh, components that have, have to be discussed. So lag time can also be a big um, parameter in a system. And this video is about the general systems theory and how it came about. So when you're teaching earth science or physical geography or geology or the teaching in high school or secondary school or teaching in Australia, in Europe, in, in, in the UK, in, in America, or North America, you're going to have various um, uh, standards of which you teach to, uh, curriculum, uh, parameters and uh, things to discuss. And you can go straight into the geology, you can go straight into different things, but what students have to understand is that uh, it's, the Earth is very dynamic in nature. It's very old. It goes in cycles. It is constantly evolving, changing, adapting, fluctuating. It is also obviously made of parts or components, the spheres, which we discussed in different video, and how they interact. So the ability for students to, to, to gather all this information, to make sense of all this information, is very hard. It's very difficult because they don't have the experience or the know-how or the education yet to take a very, what's called a very holistic and very broad approach to this subject. We're used to going straight into that individual component, let's say a river, or how a lake forms, or how ocean waves form, or how uh, cumulus clouds form, the form thunderstorm clouds. You go straight into that one uh, discrete topic and forget that the, the, that single topic only works because of this very large, complex, dynamic, old system that is constantly cycling, constantly evolving, and involving the different spheres. So you can actually just use this as an introductory unit of how to present the Earth as this huge, massive, moving system, and even touch on the Gaia theory as well. The Gaia theory, the, the, the living Earth, the Earth is alive, which has a lot of um, cool things to discuss. But the general systems theory came from a sequence of scientists that discovered various things that 
allowed us to appreciate the Earth as a system. So as you can see, there are a ton of different scientists on this on this uh, board, and it really starts up here with Stenner, Danish uh, geologist, scientist, and really it started with a shark head. Uh, there was a shark head that was caught and in Denmark, and they wanted uh, Steno to do the autopsy and and figure out what was going on with this shark. And he figured out the uh, shark's tooth was very similar to a different tooth they found uh, in a rock layer deposited, and he made some uh, connections between them and started to, his brain started to think about, um, you know, how the land surface forms and how fossils get, get into the, the ground and the, the different uh, processes that must happen and really start to scientifically understand how things work as opposed to some historical ideas of things formed from the sky or magically growing inside the rock. The Steno is really in, in 1669 was really the first person scientist to start to question and do studies on the earth. Then about 100 years later, you got James Hutton. All right, here we go. So the father of modern day geology. Hutton, Scottish, um, and uh, looked at rock layers and started to see different formations, started to argue the age of the earth because the age of the earth was under a lot of um, arguments and different controversies back in those days of how old it is from a couple of thousand years, a couple of million years, and then obviously hundreds of millions of years, and Hutton kind of like introduced the idea that the Earth is extremely old, and these cycles and these rock layers and these rock uh, processes take a long time to occur. So those start, start to figure out the principles of geology. Then you've got Lyell, which uh, started to looking at the principles of uh, uniformitarianism, and also Smith, William Smith, who looked at strata. So you've got Hutton, uh, well, let's just add it in here. So Steno, let's use, uh, let's use, let's use black. So uh, Steno obviously was looking at uh, the laws. So superposition. And looking at horizontality. There we go. Hutton was the age mostly and the rock layers. Lyle or Smith was the strata and fossils, using them to ID the rock and get that relative age, relative age. And Lyle was looking at the principles and add them all together. And uniformitarianism. Okay. Then we went into Davis. Now Davis looked at erosional cycles. Now these guys are all on various geologic um, principles. Steno, Hutton, Lyle, and Smith. Then we get onto Davis, which is about, you know, 60, 70 years on from Lyle, and he was suggesting that there's a big cycle in erosional patterns, erosional processes, weather and erosion uh, with fluvial systems, breaking down of rock, and there's a cycle, there's a system. So we're looking at now the first element of, well, looking at age and time, absolute age of the Earth, now looking at the, the cycles and the, the temporal patterns. And looking at the spatial as well. Certain areas are broken down more than others. And then we have Albert Penck. Uh, Penck uh, looked at, well, he died in 45. Uh, Penck looked at uh, ice cores and ice layers and was pioneering in stratigraphy and looking at the different layers and how they form with ice, with glacial deposits mostly in the Pleistocene um, uh, era. And he was the first person to really suggest the term geomorphology. 
So you can see this logical progression starting with Steno in Denmark uh, in the, uh, the 17th century and, and going through these different amazing scientists and now starting to figure out how the Earth's landscape is starting to form and the different processes and the cycles that, that go to creating our landforms. So speaking of geomorphology, now looking at um, Gilbert over here in 1880, over here on the left-hand side. He was the first person to really suggest about an open system, the Earth being an open system with energy and matter flowing in and out, and um, discussed the term dynamic equilibrium. So he was the first person to really suggest that these things are working as a, as a function of different systems, different spheres, and they are in dynamic equilibrium. But also back in those days, dynamic did mean also steady state. Those two words were very interchangeable, that dynamic and steady state were the kind of the same. Now we kind of differentiate those terms um, a little differently. So Strayer in 52, the same as Gilbert, was looking at the, uh, the processes as an open system. And Corley as well in 62, uh, 10 years on, was also looking at uh, basically, you know, look, starting, to, starting to just discuss the uh, general systems theory. Uh, as an open system and kind of like add on to what Straher and originally Gilbert had suggested. So now we get on to the bottom name, Ludwig, Ludwig von Bertalanthi. Bertalanthi, all right, or Fi, Bertalanthi. This is in 68, so still pretty recent uh, considering, all right. So this guy was technically or given the first person really to suggest uh, the term general systems theory. He was the first person to coin the phrase, use it, publish it, and discuss how the earth works in this uh, very holistic approach where all the different systems are, are working at, uh, together, functioning together to create this, this, this general systems that work all across the planet. And he was the one that really looked at this, this holistic approach. So Ludwig von Bertalanthi in 68, right? He developed this theory and it was a theory that would, that would encompass different concepts, different disciplines. For example, obviously biology, even psychology, even look into the physical sciences, obviously with geology and physics, and obviously how we can relate this to education. Because even in the 60s, education of, of earth science was, was evolving, was changing, was, you know, uh, it was changing with the new, new discoveries that happened, the new, new experiments, the new investigations, on different areas of the planet, both oceanography, uh, geology, atmospheric science. So it was constantly evolving and to, to help education, they used this general systems theory to explain how everything works together as a system, which is the, the, the backbone now of most curriculums in North America, Europe, and Australia is that, that systems concept. So it can be applied to other disciplines. Now, in terms of geology, in terms of earth science and geoscience, we can look at each sphere, each component, as an individual thing and how they interact. But how we, how we connect these, how we connect, or how it connects in nature, to other spheres and other things, that is the most important part of general systems theory is how it connects, how we understand the, the, uh, the approach of, of when they work together, the outcome. So all different inputs, you know, the, the, the million different inputs that we can study, how they all combine into one planet, one system, and how 
this works and how it can change and how it can create equilibriums or not and how lag time affects different systems and how each sphere interacts that is basically what um is the backbone for geomorphology um for geology itself that's the backbone of it all right so i hope, you, hope this uh, this helps you with your studying to explain like a nice base base or foundation or starting point for geomorphology and how we approach the subject and obviously you know in the classroom i would introduce this as uh, a project or an activity where i would look at uh, each of the spheres, how they connect, but also try and look at one one example, let's say a river or a, a waterfall or a volcano, and just ask the students how to connect the spheres and how this, how you would approach this uh, as one thing and break it down into different components and explain also the history timeline of, of how this came to be, how this theory uh, was accepted because of the work by prior scientists, prior geniuses, that paved the way uh, for this theory to be to be um, appreciated. All right, thanks, guys.